I'm waiting for everyone in the balconies to be seated. <laughs> what? Y'all didn't know there were angels here? They? Up in the balconies here? I know they're here. They've been laughing at me all morning. Okay. I mean, wow. Come in and the computer wasn't back there and I had power, PowerPoint, you know, and so I uh, grabbed my computer, put it in there and uh, learned uh, all the technology <laughs> before I started Bible class and and uh, but uh, then I went over to my briefcase and looked in there and no notes. OK, <laughs> so I have absolutely no notes on, the, on the, the message this morning, but I do have some PowerPoint slides, I think. Keep me on track. So that means I'll either be two minutes or two hours. You know, it, <laughs> it depends on uh, the, the deal there. But then, then lastly, I was going through my wife's purse looking for some breath mints, and uh, my wife comes over and says, "What are you doing?" So I'm going through your purse. She says, "That's not my purse." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and as I looked in the purse, I thought. What happens in Pilot Point stays in Pilot Point. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, it's good to be here. Once there was a man who was very, very, very lucky. In fact, every game that he played, he always won. And he was so lucky, he decided he would become a gambler. And he was a professional gambler. And one day, he was in a card game, and in this card game, he was sitting down with three of the richest men in town. Well, the cards were dealt. He picked up his hand, and he could hardly contain the smile on his face. He had been dealt a near-perfect hand. He was trying to control his eyes and his facial movement so he didn't give it away. And he thought to himself, I've been waiting for this moment my whole life. These men have the money to lose and I've got the hand to win. So he took the money out of his pocket, pushed all his chips in. Then he took his checkbook and threw it in the pot. Then he took his car keys and threw them in the pot and his house keys and threw it in the pot. He was called. And then he took very confidently and laid down his near-perfect hand. And his opponent laid down his perfect hand. The man was in a stupor. He was stunned. He had bet it all, everything, on only a near-perfect hand. And he lost it all. You know, you might think, well, pretty foolish to be gambling in the first place. And then to bet everything... Only on a near perfect hand. But you know what? There are folks that are doing something much more foolish than that. They're gambling with their own eternal soul. They're gambling with their own eternal soul. And so this morning, I just want to talk about some things that people are gambling their soul about. First of all, there are lots of folks out there that are gambling their soul that the goodness or the kindness of God is all there is to God. But there's nothing more. We live in a world today that people have created God in man's image. He's a soft, placating, forgiving grandpa. Doesn't matter what you do or how you live or what you believe, just jump in his lap and everything's fine. But that's simply not true. The Bible says, therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. You know, uh, in church, we talk a lot about being saved. We talk about that word saved, and we, we toss it around. 
Some people come to church because they want to be saved from some disease. And some people come because they want to be uh, saved from poverty. And some people come because uh, they want to be saved from some addiction somewhere. But what are we really saved from? You know, R.C. Scroll said in one of his books that he was on a, doing a seminar. And he asked the question, what are we saved from? And the answer that he gave shocked everyone there. For he said, I have read the Bible for over 30 years. And I have come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ came to save us from God. From God. For God said, and this was to Christians who had left the Lord Jesus. He said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You see, the Bible teaches that we are saved from the wrath of God against sin. In fact, these are the words of Jesus. He said, and I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he killed, has killed has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say you fear him. Jesus didn't know that the word hell is a word that is not PC, politically correct. He didn't know that. Do you know I, I, I do seminars for a living? Uh, and I was doing one, and I've only been censured one time. I was doing it for about 300 ladies in Arkansas. We are talking about the stock market, of course. And I said, uh, it looks like the market could go to hell in a handbasket. And then I was reproached to my boss, saying, you can't use that word, hell. It brings up too many bad thoughts, and people... A lot of people don't believe in it. So you can't talk about it. But you know, Jesus did believe in it. He gave us a little picture of the end of time. He showed us a picture of the judgment day. And he said on the judgment day that he's going to gather everyone together. And there'll be some who are there who will say, uh, Lord, Lord, did we not do this in your name and that in your name and this in your name? And he will say to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. In fact, in Matthew 25 and 41, it says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Jesus said there is a hell and that it is fire and that it is everlasting. Because that is the wrath of God against sin. We live in an age today where we don't think about anything as being wrong in this world. And it's getting worse. But if really you have a real hard time in believing that there is a hell, then all you've got to really do is go to the cross. Because when you see Jesus Christ nailed to the cross, what you're seeing is the full wrath of God coming against sin. When Jesus was praying in the garden, he was saying, Lord, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, thy will be done. Thy will, the will of God, was that sin has to be paid for. If it's not paid for, God is an unjust God. Throughout all eternity, if he just says to everyone, come on in, it's all right, then everyone would look at God and say, he lied, and God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. So when you look at the cross, what you're seeing is you're seeing 
the wrath of Almighty God. You're seeing Jesus drink every single drop of God's wrath from that cup on one side. And you're seeing on the other side the love of God. And they come together and kiss at the cross. You know, if you had to describe the Old Testament, and really, what, what is the Old Testament about? In one word, what would it be? And the answer is access. Access. God spent thousands of years teaching that not everyone has access to God. What he did with the Ark of the Covenant, he had them build a tent called the Tabernacle. And the tent kept all the Jews, the Israelites, outside and away from God. And inside, only the priests could come. And inside that tented off area, there was a building. And in that building, there were two places inside of it, separated by a curtain. And the one place was called the Holy Place. Priests could go in there, all of them, but there was another place behind the curtain. It was called the Holy of Holies. And no one could go in there but the great high priest. And he could only go in with the blood of a lamb or he would be killed. Every Jew wanted to be in the presence of God, but they couldn't be. And the priest could only be because of the blood of an innocent lamb, which was a free figure of Jesus. Become. And there's a story in 1 Samuel, I believe it's 6, in which uh, it tells a story about a, a, a horrible event that happened where the enemies of God stole the Ark of the Covenant. This is the place where God said, I will meet my people. And his presence was between the cherubim. Now on top of that, or underneath the cherubim, was a, a plate of, the, uh, of steel or gold. And it was uh, the mercy seat, but there was a word, propitiation. It was called the propitiation. That's a big word. That just means it's the, forget, the place of forgiveness, the place of appeasement to God, the place of where the satisfaction of sins is made, and that's why they put the blood of a lamb on it. Well, when the enemies of God stole the ark, then, then there were several plagues that came over them. And as these plagues came over them, they said, we got to get this thing out of here. And so they shifted back to God's people, the Israelites, and they put it on a cart. And when it got there, there were thousands of Israelites there. It came in, and they looked at the ark, and they did something very, very foolish. They pushed aside the mercy seat. And when they pushed aside the mercy seat, God killed over 50,000 Israelites. 50,000. Why? Because you see, inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments. And when you look at the law of God without the blood of the Lamb, you face the wrath of God. Just like today, if you're living a life without the blood of the Lamb, you're facing the wrath of God. Let me talk about this because it's really the scandal of Christianity. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. And you have to agree with me that the media is against us, isn't it? Doesn't the media talk about Christianity and always make, uh, say bad things about it? And the rest of the religions of the world are against Christianity. They all are. But you know, we could change that in one single day by just taking one little word out of there. If we change V to A, that Jesus is a way and a truth and a life, then guess what? Media would love us. Why, even Hollywood would take us in. 
All the religions of the world would pat us on the back and say, come on in, join us. Because you're just a way and we're a way. And there are a number of different ways to God. But no, it's not true. There is only one way to God. And that's Jesus Christ. And that's why without him, uh, we're in trouble. It's the scandal of Christianity. Let's look at the second thing that people are gambling their soul on. They're gambling their soul that as far as uh, being right with God is concerned, saving faith is just a, a mental ascent. In other words, if, if you just say some words and it's like coming to Jesus and you're trying to close a deal, you know, and you got the contract there and you write your name on it, you just say these words, I, I believe in Jesus, you know, and what happens then? Well, if you believe in Jesus, then you're saved, and you're not only saved at that moment, you're saved forever, and you can never fall from grace, ever, ever. Well, let me, let's talk about that for a minute, because I really think that the word belief or faith has been hijacked, and it's been changed in its meaning. Well, in Greek, the word faith is in the present continual tense. It's a present continual tense verb. Now, you know what that means? Well, that means it's just not a one-time ascent. In fact, if you look at, uh, at it, it's, there are three things about it. First of all, it is believing the facts and accepting the truth. Well, that's, you know, that's normal. You know. Then secondly, though, it's believing in. Now, that means... Trusting and obeying. Um, when I'm doing this in the jail, or when I'm doing this even amongst Christians, you know, I, I will ask them, well, how many of you believe in John Kimbrough? Raise your hand. <laughs> and nobody raises their hand. You believe that? Not a soul. Well, raise their hand. And I say, well, how many of you believe John Kimbrough exists? And everyone raises their hand. Because there's a big, big difference between, between believing that something exists and believing in something. You see, the demons believe that Jesus came to earth, that he was the son of God. They believe that he died on the cross. In fact, the same demons are here today that were at the cross. They don't die. They believe. But it doesn't save them. The belief has to go to trusting and obeying. But even more than that, it is a continual tense verb. That is, it has to continue on. It has to continue on. You know, in uh, John 20 and 31, it says there are many other things that Jesus did that are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe. In the, in the Greek, that you might continue to believe. And those that believe, continue to believe, will have eternal life. Uh, and uh, those who do not continue to believe will not have it. So it's a continual sense. And you know, we have to be careful in the church that we can point our fingers at other religious groups and say, well, what about the other things that you have to do to be right with God? You know, and in reality, <laughs> in reality, sometimes we're the same way. I mean, I, I have come up to brethren and try to talk to them about salvation. You know what they do? They look at me and say, well, I was baptized in a horse trough outside of old John Smith's house. And I say, well, that's nice, I guess, you know. Uh, you don't have to be baptized in the Jordan River, but, you know, really, what's that got to do with it? You came into Christ. What I'm asking you is, how, what is your relationship today with Jesus? Is he the center of your life today? It's like me asking a teenager, hey, how are you doing in school? And he goes, well, when I was in kindergarten, boy, I was killing it. <laughs> what difference does that make? What are you doing today? Is Jesus the center of your life today? Are you serving him today, worshiping him today? You see what I'm saying? So it's, it's more than just that uh, leap. In 1 John chapter 1, it says, 
But if we walk in the light, walk is action. Okay. If we walk in the light, uh, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses uh, us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the truth is not in us. Do you see how many times the word if is in there? Every single verse. If is a little big word. If. So what happens if you don't? You don't have the things that he's talking about here. But what does it mean, walking in the light? But if we walk in the light, it's action. It's, it's, it's fellowship with Jesus Christ. Somebody said, well, it means you don't sin. No. If it meant we didn't sin, they wouldn't have any sins to be washed clean, would we? No, it means that we have a fellowship with Jesus Christ. Now, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let me put it this way. If you are not struggling with a sin in your life right now, that sin has already got you. Life in Christ against sin is a constant struggle. There's a battle between the spirit and the flesh. If you're not struggling, you think you've got it made. You think you don't have sin. You're in big, big trouble. The first words out of Jesus' mouth when he came to earth and his very first sermon, he ended that sermon by saying what? Uh, he by, by saying, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. As perfect as God? Are you kidding me? As perfect as God? One time a, a preacher was reading his Bible on, on an airplane and the guy sitting next to him wanted to make a conversation. So he, he looked over at the preacher and said, hey, well, you read, I see you read your Bible there. What, what, what would I have to do to be saved? He says, oh, that's easy. He said, you just have to live without uh, making a sin or committing a sin in thought, word, or deed from the time you're born to the time you die. <laughs> and he goes, what did you say? He said, oh, I said, easy. All you have to do is from the time you're born, never sin uh, one single time in thought, word, or deed. And you can go right in. Well, of course, we, you know, we know that's not true, don't we? We know that we all sin. And we struggle with sin. But that's what he tells us here. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does that mean that, that it, it, if, I, if I catch myself committing a sin uh, or something like that in my mind or whatever thought, maybe it's a lust, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, whatever it is that I've got to fall to my knees at that moment and pray or I'm going to hell? No, that doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is you have to have an attitude, <coughs> an attitude of confession, an attitude of coming before God and thanking him for the salvation we have in Jesus. If we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar. And then I want to end with this one because we're coming close to time to end. And I don't have my notes, so I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> that salvation is just for an elect few. You know, there's two, two sides to that. There's the Christian side, and there's the side of the person in the world. Let's talk first about the Christian side, okay? Sometimes you can look around, and you think, oh, these people got it together, you know? <laughs> they got it together. Look at me. And then you sin, and Satan comes to you. What's the first thing he does? Oh, look at you. You've sinned that same sin again? You know how many times you've done that? I can tell you right here, you know? You've done it all the time. You sin against God, and, but you think you're good enough to go into heaven with all the sins you committed in your life and, and what you've done and you're sinning now, you're going to sin today, you're going to sin tomorrow. What about that? What happens to a Christian when he sins? Well, let's go to the next verse there after that last one in 1 John. That's chapter 2, verse 1. He says, My little children, 
These things I write to you that you may not sin. That's the attitude he wants, God wants, that you don't sin, that you uh, understand your sins, and that you struggle against them. But then look at what he says. That you sin not. And if any man sin, what does he got to do? Has he got to be saved all over again? He's got to do all the stuff again and go back to, to the beginning? No. He says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now that word advocate is paraclete. It is the word for lawyer. I taught this in jail because I have I'm head of jail ministry. And in jail, I got into it with one of the guys. <laughs> I had about nine men, and I said, Jesus is an advocate. He's your lawyer. And the guy goes, I hate lawyers. <laughs> I hate them. I hate them. You know what this lawyer did to me? And blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, look, this is not about you. Okay? It's not about your case. This is about Jesus Christ. And he's a lawyer, and he's not like other lawyers. He's not like lawyers in this world. The lawyers in this world, they can know a man is in, innocent. And they can have video and DNA evidence. And uh, they can have eyewitnesses and blood trails and everything else. And still the lawyer gets up and what does he say? He's innocent, Your Honor. Let me give you some reasonable doubt. But our lawyer's not like that. Jesus Christ, my lawyer, is there. He comes to my side. He doesn't run away from me when I sin. And I sin and I cry out to the Father and Jesus stands there with me before God. You know what he says? He says, this man is guilty. <laughs> what? My lawyer's telling him I'm guilty. But see, Jesus can't lie. I'm guilty. But instead of trying to say that I'm not guilty. What Jesus says is he's guilty, Your Honor, but this is my plea. My nail-scarred hands. My blood that was shed for him, Father. He's the righteous, Jesus Christ. His righteousness is for us who are in Christ. And so he says, count the cross, Father. Count it again and again and again, and I live. Why? Because it says, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Now, what was that word? I told you a minute ago. What was it? It was the mercy seat of the Ark of Covenant where the blood was placed, where God was appeased and his wrath was turned away from the children of Israel. Well, Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. He's our propitiation, our satisfaction. And then look at what it says. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the what? The whole world. Now, does that mean the whole world is saved then? Without doing anything? No, it doesn't. What it means is this. Whosoever believes, and we know what believe means now. Whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life. For what? God's wrath abides or remains on them. So they have to do it. They have to believe. They have to come to Jesus. Right? They have to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. But it's not just for an elect few. It's not just for a few that God said, you're going to be saved. It's, it's done. Sorry. You, you, sorry, you're going to be lost. Sorry. It's just, that's just the way it is. God doesn't do that. No, he loves the world. That's all the world. He gave his only son. That whoever, whoever out there wants the love of God can have it. Whoever wants salvation can have it. This is on the world side now. I know what it is to think, how can God forgive me? because of the things I've done. I've done some very bad, wicked things. I wouldn't want to talk about it here. It would be shameful to talk about. But whoever you are, it doesn't matter. You can find the forgiveness of God. I want to end this. I knew the kids were going to come right now, so let them come on in, because I want to end it with a story. Come on in. Come on in. 
Come on in. I'm going to bite you. <laughs> you probably heard me yelling. <laughs> you know, I tried to, to wear a shirt that would brighten things up, but, you know. Once there was a preacher named Charles Finney. And the more, I said, what happens? Hundred go in and three come out. You know? <laughs> don't go, whatever you do, hon, don't go back there, all right? <laughs> uh, you can send, you can send uh, Patty and, and, and Jean there. That's okay. <laughs> but here, so this preacher named Charles Finney. And he came to this church for the first Sunday. And after he got finished preaching, he uh, was met by a man who came up and said, I want you to come over and talk with me. And so the preacher said, yes, I'll, I'll come over and talk to you. And after he walked away, the deacons of the church ran over there to him and they said, do you know who that guy was? He said, no, he's a gangster. You know that guy? He owns the casino. I mean, that guy has killed people. Man, are you going to go over there? And they, he said, well, yes, I'm going to go over there. So he went over there and, and knocked on the door. And the man opened the door. And, and Finney walked in and sat down. And, and then the man locked the door behind him. And then he's sitting there in front of him. And he takes out a gun. And he sets it on the desk. And he said, you said something in your sermon. So, what's that? He said, you said that God can love anyone and he can forgive anyone. That's what you said. He said, yeah, that's, that's true. And he said, listen. He says, I own a casino. He said, I've rigged all the games so that nobody can win. He says, I sell drugs and alcohol. I've seen lives that have been totally ruined. And I'm the one that ruined their lives. Can God love and forgive somebody like me? He said, yes. He said, you see this gun? He said, yes. He said, I've killed people with this gun. I've murdered my enemies. I'm a murderer. Can God love me and forgive me? And then he says, yes, he can. And then he says, I've been married for 16 years and I have children little children, and I've never said one kind word to them in 16 years. Can God love me and forgive me? And Finney got up out of his chair, walked over to him, grabbed him by the neck and shook him and said, if it was up to me, I'd put you in the deepest part of hell. But it's not up to me. It's up to God. And God Almighty loves you and he can't forgive you. So don't ever believe that you can't find forgiveness with God if you'll just talk. Turn to it. If you'll just have an attitude of confession and prayer and repentance. If Jesus is the center of your life, because if he's not the center of your life, I don't care if you were baptized or not. If it's the center of your life, then you're okay. Everything's fine. If you need to respond to the invitation call today, whether you're uh, here and you need the prayers of the church as a brother or sister in Christ, or whether you need to be baptized into Christ and confess his name as your Lord and Master, would you please come while together we stand and say, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If it's been a blessing to you, you can go to johndkimbrough.com to hear more episodes. You may also subscribe to my free podcast on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. You may email me at john at johndkimbrough.com for questions or comments. Thank you.